I'm a natural historian, cursed or blessed, with a really deep love of engineering and mathematics. And so I'm going to talk to you today about how I came from downtown Manhattan, New York City, to a little tiny island where I get to bring the minutia of the natural world of the sea into the lab and give you a little feel for how I get this incredible feeling of joy from translating the natural world into potential solutions to problems. I'm going to talk about biomaterials and new technologies that we can get from the sea. There are lots of organisms on the planet that can serve as useful models for new technologies. And I'm going to talk to you about a really small subset. I'm going to talk to you about vertebrates from the ocean. And the reason is that when you discover some new technology based on an organism, something that's bio-inspired, there is a huge leap that must be made in order to turn that into something that is biomedically relevant. The reason is in you. You are a bag of horribly corrosive fluid filled with fouling agents. <laughs> and so when we come with a new solution based on land and then try and translate it into human, the field of human health, this is a big stumbling block. But the sea, the sea is a cauldron of horrible salty mess with lots of fouling agents and irregular surfaces and things. So it's the perfect proving ground for things that we might later want to translate into human health. The first thing I'm going to talk to you about is suction cups from the sea. This is the northern clingfish. It lives in the rocky intertidal and sticks onto rocks. And the natural historian in me has been flipping rocks on these islands for more than 20 years and looking at this little fish attached to slimy, irregular surfaces and launching from this attachment, launching attacks on limpets. They eat the most prototypical of attached invertebrates, these things that suck down. On the belly of this fish is a suction cup. And I became fascinated. How does this suction cup work? Could it be imitated? Well, first, what does the fish do with this suction cup? This is a dead clingfish. We've tied it to a machine that pulls it up, and it is sucked down to a rock. It's lifting hundreds of times its own body weight, dead. It does even better if it's alive, but you could never do such a horrible thing to a fish that was alive. So what does this suction cup look like? How can we begin to think about imitating it? Well, here's a picture of it. This is a terrible suction cup. When you look at that, you do not think, hey, nice suction cup, man, that's, that's nice and smooth. No, that cup shouldn't suck. It's got all sorts of lumps and crap on it. How can that possibly work? Well, first of all, my first look at this, I say maybe, maybe it's dead flat and those, those lumps are covered over with some beautiful glassy material that I don't see. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of the same thing. Those lumps are real. It's really covered with these giant blocks. This is not the suction cup that you used on the end of a dart that you shot at your sibling's forehead. This is, this is a very different kind of suction cup. In fact, if we look really close at those lumps, we see something remarkable. We see hairs. You've heard probably of biomimetic attachment systems based on hairs. The gecko's toes, those little tiny fibers, these are the same size, the same aspect ratio, the same length and width as gecko hairs with many pretty substantial differences. They're really soft and pliable, and they are very cylindrical like pasta. They don't have that spatulate ending that the gecko's hairs have. 
But clearly, they must be involved somehow in this attachment. So we set out to try to understand how well the clingfish attach to different surfaces. Here's some data. I know that all of you are deep lovers of data. Here is data. Along that x-axis is the roughness of the surface, from glassy smooth to really rough. And on the y-axis is how strongly it attaches. And there is a glassy surface. That is, it is nanoscale smooth. And that fish is sucking down with more than 300 times its body weight. It's doing very well. When we attach it instead to very, very fine polishing sandpaper, it still attaches well. In fact, better than it attached to glass. We keep getting rougher and rougher and rougher, and it just sticks the same, all the way up to a roughness of sandpaper about what you'd use to tear off the finish on an old wood floor, 240 grit sandpaper, and that fish is still sticking better than it did to glass. This is an awesome suction cup. This is a suction cup that could have stuck to my formerly hairy head. It's incredibly impressive. But there has to be some endpoint. And in fact, Petra Ditska, who's also living here on the island, figured out where that limit is. If you get rough enough, poof, the suction falls through the floor. But that roughness point is incredibly rough. That critical roughness is between 2 and 5% of the disc width. A disc based on this technology the size of your paw would allow you to climb up the roughest concrete you've ever seen. This is a remarkable suction cup, which we can imagine being deployed in the field of human health, lifting an organ during surgery, so you don't have to grab it. You can just suck on and lift it. Or walking along the intestine during laparoscopic surgery in order not to be pinching it as you pull the camera along. So we can see lots of applications. And in fact, you can't patent a critter. It turns out that that's illegal. But if you can figure out what the critter's doing, you can patent the trick. And so we've done that. A normal suction cup is, fails in this way. On a smooth surface, as the cup is pulled away, the edges of the cup move towards the center. So the diameter of the cup is continually decreasing. The circumference of the cup is continually decreasing. The material of the cup is being crammed into a smaller and smaller area. As that's happening, there's an increasing compressive pressure on the material at the edge of the cup until finally, boom, it fails, it buckles, and water or air rushes in. This method of failure happens in all the suction cups that you buy in the store. It's the same method of failure that happens in our suction cups that are soft and have a hairy edge. On a dead smooth surface, they fail the same way a normal suction cup fails. But if you put them on a rough surface, they do something completely different. Those little hairs now interdigitate with the surface. And as you pull on the suction cup, the diameter of the cup does not change. It stays the same, and it stays the same until you hit the elastic limit of the material, and then it pops. And that's why, at any roughness, the cup has exactly the same suction. It's really quite, quite amazing. So here we have a new solution to sticking to rough surfaces that comes from the sea. And a very reasonable question is, is this a repeatable trick or is this a one-off? And when I moved my lab here six years ago, I came here with the idea that having the sea right next door would make a huge difference, and it has. We've, we've pursued many of these projects, always finding some new solution to a problem. So I'm going to tell you about another little, a little problem that really is the uh, brainchild of one of my graduate students. But here, I'm in the water with 17 manta rays. 
These are the largest rays in the world, and they're filter feeding. They live on plankton. These animals can have wingspans of 10 meters, 30 feet. And they're eating prey you can barely see. And I spent hours underwater watching these fish swim. And I come away with a natural history observation. As the fish swim, periodically they'll open their mouth to start filtering. And you cannot tell from their swimming whether their mouth is open or closed. This matters. If I gave you an umbrella and sent you running and then said, open it, your kinematics of your, of your running would change. Oh, you know, doesn't happen. That means there's something really remarkable about the filter in the manta rays. And so this is work that Misty Pegtran, who's a professor at CSU Fullerton, did in biomimetic filtration. Our basic approach was to try to understand the way the filter worked and then to mimic that with a, with a physical model. And to understand how it works, first you have to understand what they're doing. All of you are familiar with the concept of filtration. If you eat pasta, you filter. You boil the pasta, you then decide you do not want two gallons of water with your pasta. You get a cal colander, you pour the pasta and water into the colander, and you take just the pasta, the water having passed through the holes of the colander. That is what is usually in people's minds when you say filtration. That is not what manta rays are doing. They're doing something much cooler. They are eating prey items that are far smaller than the holes in their filter. They're using hydrodynamics to spin the particles out of the water flow and pull them in the direction of the, of the esophagus so they can eat them. This is the basis of a really neat filtration system. Here's the physical model that we have. And what you can see is this is one of the filtering elements, a long rachis with leaves coming off the sides. And on each of the leaves, there's little sticky up bits. And it turns out that on each of the sticky up bits, there can be little lumps. There's a hierarchy of design. And as biomechanists, our question is, how much of that hierarchy do you need? Because if you need all of it, it's almost invariably too complicated to ever build one. Can we get away with abbreviated hierarchy? Well, we can make that model in a computer and then using this, this is the aquatic equivalent of a treadmill. It sends the water in a loop and you can put something in there and see how fluid flows across it. We put these models in there with differing levels of complexity. On top is a model that has just two levels of complexity, that long rachis with the leaves coming off it. And what you see is large vortices, large low energy vortices, and you can see some hunting back and forth of the dye stream across the face of the filter. That is a signal that there's back pressure, something we know isn't a big deal, so it's not really, we haven't, we haven't figured it out yet here in this model. We do the same thing, but now we add those little, those little tabs on each of the leaves, and immediately you can see much higher energy, higher speed, faster vortices that are tossing particles on the correct side of the filter. And that hunting behavior is gone. This is actually a lower backflow pressure filter. So we've got a filter that's able to pull particles out that are smaller than the hole. This biomimetic filter is hierarchical, but completely manufacturable. It has a vanishingly low pressure drop. I mean, on the order of less than 0.1% of the pressure going in. And it, it can't clog. It can't clog because it's catching particles that are bigger than the holes. So there's no way for it to clog. That's awesome. Anybody who's ever owned a filter has changed a filter. If you have a filter in your life, you have gone, oh darn, and had to buy a new one. <laughs> These are non-clogging. 
And in perhaps Professor Peg Tran's greatest contribution, these are variably selective. That is, one filter, and you change the flow speed across the filter, and it catches different size particles. So simply by changing your pumping velocity, you can change the selectivity profile of the filter. This has been the subject of another patent, and it's a clear bio-inspiration. So we've got manta rays inspiring a new filtering technology. And I'm trying to get you to see the link between the natural history observation, that most unapplied, blue sky seeming activity, looking at nature. And this down in the weeds, wow, here's an application that may have some implications for new technologies or even human health. So having a keen eye for natural history is absolutely a key for developing new bio-inspired materials. The answers to these problems do not lie in engineering departments. They lie in biology departments, and they don't lie in general with people like me who are trained in engineering and have come to biology. They lie with the nuts and bolts biologists who make substantive natural history observations for us to be inspired by. All of my work is done in, in sort of the light of my family and, and the supportive network that I have. And these are my, my son and my daughter, Ellie and Abel Tasman. And my life isn't worth living without, without my wife. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned all of them to show to you that Successful academics can certainly have entirely healthy um, <laughs> home lives. Thank you very much.